everyone. Welcome to the LTG Show. My name is Sean Wilburn, and today I am joined with, oh, well, all my homies right here. First, I got Andrew Lee. What up? <laughs> got Tony Hannity's. What's going on? Um, we got the movie Tony Hannity's is watching in the background, so we're going to have that featured in today's show. We also it's a have... special day. <laughs> and we have, back by popular demand, because everyone's been asking for him, Mr. Rad for Cash, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> we cut your cheers off that message. That's all you get, buddy. Yeah. That's all you get. <laughs> Internet fail. <laughs> Internet fail, dude. What the heck? Is it Comcast fault? What is it? It's everything. It's everything. Yeah. Yeah, (laughs) So we're happy to have him back, even though he's been struggling with technology. Right. (laughs) Only the tech guy is struggling with technology. That's how kind of works. Irony at its best. (laughs) It really is. All right. So we're. This is the LTG show, part of the Lazy Tech Guys. Let me start off and give you a little bit of contact information here. First off, you can email us at comments at lazytechguys.com, or you can give us a call at area code 707-722-5299. Now that that's out the way, let's actually talk about what we really want to talk about, and that's Apple, and that's about rumors and the next iPhone. Because guess what? It looks like we might have a date for the announcement. Tony, what do we have going on? Well, according to sources from all things D, Apple is set to announce the next iPhone and hopefully some more uh, answers about the Mac Pro on September 10th. Now, last year around this time, the iPhone 5 was announced on September 12th, so it's around the same kind of week and around the same kind of time frame um, in terms of a 365 turnaround. So it makes sense. It's not too far off base. Um, so there's definitely a lot of questions uh, regarding the iPhone 5s or the iPhone 5c, and Sean, you love you love all the jokes with that. But um, you know, are they going to unveil the premium iPhone as well as the kind of lesser cost iPhone that's colorized? Um, is it going to have NFC since ISIS did say that they would be including the iPhone in their integrated system? And uh, what are the things does iOS 7 going to bring to the table that they haven't yet ar- that, that they haven't yet already announced? So it's kind of exciting. And then also the Mac Pro. The big question is how much is this mother? Because you know we 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 talked about it. Um, it's 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 a heck of a device, but it's really only going to sell if it's the same price or maybe maybe a little bit cheaper. But anything beyond what what it is right now, especially with powerful Mac Minis, and it's almost like what's the point? So. But yeah, September 10th is the supposed date, and we will find out more as time goes on. Tony, remember this is going to have the fingerprint scanner I'm so excited about. Oh, yes, the fingerprint scanner. Now, forget about the fingerprint scanner. Well, because I only talk about things that matter. Ooh. Ooh, like waterproof. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't say waterproof. Or sleeping watching your video. Or browsing with your eyeballs. There you go. <laughs> exactly my point. Things that don't matter, I don't mention. <laughs> yeah, the waterproof though. Remember we talk about with those Sony phones all the time. Which, real quick side note, my friend just picked up a uh, Sony phone, and guess what? The first thing he said was, "Hey, apparently it's waterproof." <laughs> Tony, I just want to give you that one. Okay, fine. I- I'll give you that. Maybe it's good to have waterproof. Anyway, as far Maybe, as the next iPhone, yeah, so the f- the the um the scanner thing is interesting to me. It also like a new way of unlocking the phone. That's co- that could be completely interesting, but. You know, it, I don't know. Are you guys excited for the next iPhone, or do you guys think it's going to be more of the same, really? I'm excited. Okay, you're excited, Tony. Okay, Rad, you're excited. Is that like some of the uh, the iPhone love in the place where you work kind of rubbing off on you now there, or what do we got? Lots of stuff rub on me, <laughs> <laughs> So, including the iPhone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, I just want to see uh, what kind of stuff, if you're going to make any uh, major changes to its design. But knowing Apple, it's probably going to be very similar to what we're already seeing. I'm wondering if it's going to be a bigger screen, so that's what I'm curious about. Well, didn't they say last year that you didn't need a bigger screen? They just need to make, you it, make it taller. taller? <laughs> Isn't that the whole point of the design behind the iPhone, whatever number they're on now? Yeah. <laughs> X1. Exactly. So on the Chip iPhone... edition. <laughs> well, there were some uh, high-res shots of the iPhone 5C in lime green or whatever green color that you call it, and these are... Um, they show the back, the front, the insides, and um, I mean, it really looks like this is going to this whole kind of color option is going to be um, a real thing. So um, they didn't really go into detail as to um, like what other um, hardware 
improvements are going to be inside the uh, iPhone 5C, but uh, in terms of size, it looks like it's the same as the 5. So to answer your question, Rad, no physical difference in screen, um, but it looks like they're going to, at least for the 5C, they're going to move away from the, the metal chassis to this kind of plasticky, rubberized material. So but supposedly it's still cheap good. then, right? I mean, so that's, that's supposed to be, right? It's the cheap. That's the joke, <laughs> right? It's supposed to stand for color or cheap, one of the two. That, did you watch our last podcast? Because I would not I, – I'm sorry, dude. The, to me, it's, the C seems to go for cheap. We're going to go for metal to yeah. plastic, cheap. Yes, very cheap. So, okay, so that, this is funny. So you well, guys wait, just, wait, hold on, hold on. I, uh, I, hold okay. on. All right, you can't all right. go say metal or plastic means that it's cheap. Look at all these other devices that are Like the Samsung plastic. Galaxy S4. Yeah, I know, but they already started. <laughs> or like, you know, started um, it's like, a, a Lumia. <laughs> all of the galaxies. It's <laughs> plastic. They already, they already started. All those phones are, are plastic. Look, but they started there. That's the difference. Apple started with the aluminum stuff, and then they're so special. No, they didn't. Yeah, Apple. No, Apple yeah. didn't start with the... They, they they plastic. Plastic. It was plastic. They yes. Oh, you're it was right. Pla- it, was, it was glass and then I'm plastic. The, mm-hmm. Well, they had glass. I'm thinking the iPods. My bad. Sorry. I'm thinking of the metal back of the iPad I used to have. Dang it. Okay, Sean fail. Fine, Sean fail. <laughs> I'll take the fail. Whatever the case may be, um, <laughs> we don't we don't think that uh, they're going to be announcing the next iPad at this at this juncture, which is probably going to be the case. I don't think they're going to be doing it this year. Um, uh, in, in terms like an iPad 6 or whatever. Um, but I'm hoping that they do like the one more thing and say, oh, here's an iPad mini with a retina display to shut all you guys up. Because they, they really need a, a small tablet with a higher resolution screen with all these uh, all these tablets coming out from, um, win, uh, from well, yeah, Windows and Android and, and uh, what's that other operating system? Something. But, As but yeah. you said, it's not important. I know you don't mention anything that's not important, so what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I'm glad you finally agree. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I want to take this to the next topic here because it kind of goes hand in hand. You guys have said that you guys expect Apple to kind of do some of the same with a couple new features, rather hope for a larger screen. But Larry Ellison, the guy who has a, his little two cents into Oracle. He had a little bit. To, he's going to have a little bit to say on an interview that's actually going to air Tuesday morning. So as we record this, which is Monday night, they put out a little snippet. And because of who we are, I actually can play the snippet and air it on here. And should we do that, guys? Should we? 38 seconds? I think we should. Here we go. Yes, please. What is it about him? You, you, we recognize the fact that he loved Apple. He wanted to make Apple great, and he did. But what was it about him? that enabled him to do it other than he worked hard. He was brilliant. I mean, he was our Edison. He was our Picasso. He was an incredible inventor. So what happens to Apple without Steve? Well, we already know. What? We saw, we conducted the experiment. I mean, it's been done. We saw Apple with Steve Jobs. Pointing up. We saw Apple without Steve Jobs. Pointing down. We saw Apple with Steve Jobs. Pointing up again. Now, we're going to see Apple without Steve Jobs. Did I just hear a gauntlet thrown, everybody? Did I just hear someone la- throwing it down? This is Larry Ellison, man. <laughs> this is the guy who thought he could buy the Warriors. Well, that's right. He didn't yeah. get that far away. <laughs> he kind of got yeah. close. You have to admit that. <laughs> but, okay, but let's think about what he's saying here. So his whole point is the, the experiment of when Jobs was with the company, they did very well. They, he, I forget if he got left or he got fired or what the deal was or how he got it. When he wasn't with the company, this, the company did not do very well. Mm-hmm. They brought him back, and then the company has done very successful, but now he's gone. And now people have been rumblings about – there's been some negative rumblings about the uh, Apple, even, even as far off to have Rush Limbaugh opening his mouth about it, and I think we talked about that recently. So, what do you guys think about this statement from Larry Ellison? I mean, Rad, I know you're throwing it out the, you know, disregarding it because of this, but seriously, what do you, what is your take on this? Uh, well, it's hard to say because, for first of all, he only he was when he was at Apple, it was him and Waz, right, when they started it, and of course they the they were the first to bring like uh, PC, I mean, computers to the mainstream, and when he left. 
he left it with a CEO that didn't really know anything. Uh, John Scully was the CEO of Pepsi before he came to Apple. So he had no idea how to run even a computer shop. So they just started building pretty much anything at that point. Now they have Tim Cook. Tim Cook is a, I mean, he's a pretty smart guy. And, I, and he's one of those guys that was selected by Steve. And, I mean, if you remember when, before Steve departed, he said that, you know, Apple's uh, best days are ahead of him. And, you know, with Tim Cook behind him, I think it's going to be, I think things are going to be okay. I think they're just playing it a little bit more safe than their usual, but definitely not as crazy or as, like, out of control as they were when they had John Scully as the CEO back then. So I, I, I part of it's kind of biased because um, Larry Ellison was very close friends with Steve, so... Um, I mean, that's kind of part of the thing, too, and he, and he admired him a lot, and so he's going to be talked about a lot in the interview. Not to downplay whatever Jobs did, but, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, there's, no, there's not going to be another Steve Jobs. That's just how it is. So. All right. So, uh, Andrew, your take on such a controversial... Anyway, what is your take on this? He, he does have a point. I would say that I kind of agree word for word for Rad, but, I mean, at the same time, it's like, well... You know, the guy wouldn't have his position if Steve Jobs originally did appoint him there mm-hmm. as his replacement. So, it, honestly, it's it's really hard to soon to tell how dip how fast it's going to dip because right now, I think what Apple stocks only dipped slightly in the recent past, just only a little bit. Yeah, actually, they made a gain. So in the last report that they when they did their financials, they actually gained. Oh, okay. From the last one, so they actually exceeded mm-hmm. expectations, but it's it's one of those things where they they just understand the business so well, and you know, knowing Tim Cook's background, his is more in operations, so he's not so. Steve Jobs was very more. I, I don't want to say flamboyant because he wasn't flamboyant. I would say more was, revolutionary, maybe. Yeah, yeah, he was more revolutionary because he was he had a vision, so he had mm. like what he thought was going to be, you know, it was iPhone, and after that it was iPad, and and. You know, and Tim Cook was kind of like the operations guy. He knows how to get the company to make money out of anything. So, you know, Steve Jobs was like, I want to be able to do this. And originally, Steve Jobs, the, the, the funny thing is, it wasn't really Steve Jobs that instantiated the App Store. You know, it was someone else. You know, he actually didn't want the App Store, but the App Store was the thing that disrupted the rest of the marketplace. So, um, are Apple's best days ahead of him? It really depends on another guy, I think, Johnny Ive. More than Tim Cook, so, Sir Johnny I. Yeah, Sir Johnny I. Right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's one of those things. It's a, uh, it's a. Uh, uh, they, there's still a lot of, a lot. It's not like Apple's going to go away or anything. They're definitely more consumer oriented. The only thing I would like to see Apple do though is pre- kind of bring back the roots on the pro side of things because right now they're kind of shaky on that side. But other than that. Well, well, I would almost wonder how the cloud is affecting their desire to want to go pro. And that, by my friend, is another article for a whole other day yeah, in itself yeah. if you really think about it. Right. Tony, how about you? You're you're the big mobile genius here. Actually, more <laughs> of a mastermind than a genius, but whatever. So what is your <laughs> take on this? <laughs> well, I think Rad nailed it on the head. Tim Cook is no yeah, Steve yeah. Jobs, but... Um, for what he's doing in in the driver's seat right now. I think he's doing a pretty good job. Now, Sean, you said, I think it was about a year ago, we're going to have to wait at least five years to see some actual major changes um, between uh, what we have now to to seeing something that's more, ev- uh, more revolutionary than evolutionary. Because right now we're seeing a bunch of evolutionary stuff. The iPad mm-hmm. mini, we're seeing you know the I- uh, iPhone 5S or the iPhone 5C or both or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not seeing anything that wows, wows us except for, like I said last week, maybe the Mac Pro, um, which to you, Rad, that might be something on the... Um, I don't know if that goes on your whole Apple catering toward the Pro side of it or not. Mm-hmm. But um, I I don't think Apple is going to go anywhere. I don't think people are just going to say, oh, I'm, I've given up on them because Steve Jobs isn't there. That's not going to happen. No but, but at the same time, they can't rest on their laurels. They have to be able to innovate. And like you said, I do believe believe that John uh, Sir Johnny Ive is going to help that company um, very much so. Um, he had a big... Um, big voice when it came to iOS 7 
and um, there's a lot of controversy with it or not. I said, sir, there's a lot of controversy with it or not, but um, in any case, it is the next upgrade to iOS, and there are vast amount of improvements uh, that are going to help the I iPhone and I or the iDevice community. And whether it's a copy or not of other operating systems that are already out there, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it's just going to help the operating system and the, uh, like I said, the community. But it's they they need to do something very different. Fingerprint scanner. I don't know if that's going to do it, but they're trying. So I have a question for you, Tony. Do you think that we're just like? It just seems like uh, you know, being us in the tech industry. Do you think we're just stuck in this bubble that? You know, we're we're only going after the thing that kind of excites the press. We're not doing, we're not looking at the real grand scheme of why they're not doing certain things. Like, uh, for instance, I have had my my chance to like develop for iOS, Android, Windows Phone, and all this other stuff. And what I realize about iOS is that it's very standardized, right? Like, if they made any changes, it would be so. I mean, it would be so drastic that you know developers would have a hard time wanting to write for that. You know, for that platform, you like you have iOS, and then you have Android. Android is like mostly written because there's just too many of them. You know what I mean? And um, it for for me, it almost seems like that the uh, that they're really trying to just turn a few things here and they're not not trying to go outside of trying to stay a little bit safe until something more disruptive comes along. I I don't know if there if there's going to be anything like that for a while, but I mean. If you guys remember, Steve Jobs was there when Apple was in the crapper. I mean, it was like one dollar a share when he when he came back to Apple, and everyone yeah, thought after, that he was crazy. After yeah. he um, got Pixar, yeah, after he, he had left, Pixar. he left next, got Pixar, and yeah, then went back to like, Apple. He went back to little Apple. Little. Yeah. yeah, and that was still a long way. I mean, it was mm -hmm. like it was not until 2004. Now, see, he was that was 1995 when he went to Apple. That was at least nine to ten years before we saw something disruptive. So. It was, you know, he, he said, oh, you know, we had the iPhone. Everyone's like, yeah. But then when the App Store came out, that's when everyone was like, holy crap, this is this is the thing that's going to really take off. So, but yeah. Hmm. Hey, Rad, sorry. I'm, I I'm think throwing, I'm... I'm throwing this out there for you, Rad, because you get my point exactly. Five years, I'd say how many years down the road till something really hit? To something you, said, you, you said five. Yeah, you I said five, five. Which, isn't, which is not too much to ask for. No. I think the reason... Right the I think the reason why... <laughs> I, I, I think oh, the, <laughs> phone rad and, and movie Tony are both talking. <laughs> I think the reason why there's a lot of talk, negative talk about Apple, is because of our um, our attention span and the, like you said, the need for something amazing, the need for something to go boom. You yeah, know, exactly. something, something to be like like a huge wow effect. There's that whole yeah. rumor about Apple getting into like wearable devices, like the iWatch. When is that going to happen? That's what we want to see. We don't care about the iPhone five. We do, but we we don't really care because it's just the next generation evolutionary. Like, okay, now has some cooler colors and maybe a fingerprint scanner. We yeah. want to see the iWatch, and I think that has to do with the press. Definitely, the press just milking. The, the, um, just wanting to just wanting to really push uh, yeah, the innovation. Yeah, they're just going after the Apple heads, right? I mean, like you, you know, if there's if you walk into a if a regular guy walks into a carrier store, they're gonna either go in Apple and they're gonna see everything else, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They'll look at everything else and they'll say, "This kind of looks cool. This kind of looks cool. This kind of looks cool." Oh, Apple! I know what Apple is. And they'll right. just buy it. So I mean, it's and then but outside of that, the fingerprinting, the Siri, and all that stuff. I mean, my mom has like. Has an Apple, an iPhone. And she doesn't know anything about Siri. She's just like, oh, it talks. Yeah, and that's it. You know, I mean, her mom and her friends, and they all have iPhones, but they have no idea it talks back to them. So that's if you want to, if you want to draw a parallel, that's what Motorola and Google were trying to do with the Moto X. Now, if they're doing that or not, that's a different, that's a different conversation. But yeah. you know, they're they're trying to cater to a device that's not so techy, mm -hmm. and that just looks nice. And it's easy to use, and you know it, it's smooth, it's beautiful, and here it is, and it talks to you when you talk to it without without touching it. There's a selling point done. Who else has that? Nobody. Yeah. And it's like, okay, that that I can talk to something that's you know without holding it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And and so yeah, that that's a gimmick to us, but it's a feature to regular people. Yeah, I mean, and, it's a talking point, right? So it's yeah. like it's a talking point to say, oh look, I could browse my my browser like this. Look at me. Look, I look at, I'm like it. Yes. Uh huh. And then that's, 
it's one of those things where, um, you know, once there is a talking point where you say, oh, look, I can actually you know, answer my phone while I'm eating my barbecue. You know, it's it, when you can say that, you know, all of a sudden someone turns around and says, well, I would like my phone to do that. Yeah. That's just really what it comes down to. So, but other than that, I mean, I, Apple is pretty safe and they have... I mean, their 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 app store is second to none. But that's Indeed. the I think that's what where people are getting a little. I I, I want to say I don't know if I want to say bored, but they're 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 safe. They're not being risky at the yeah. moment, and that's what people liked about Steve Jobs. After the nine years of being in the crapper, and then he really disrupted the whole tech com com commerce scene with the iPhone and the iPod and this and that. Those were the cool years, and that's what we're, we want back, and we're expecting that from Tim Cook. And it's a lot of pressure on him, but you know the the whole company has kind of put themselves in that perspective. They they put them, they raise the bar themselves, and we expect them to live up to that bar. And right now they're they're at the bar. They're not raising it that much more. They're just there. So. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can think of them, and this is probably a little bit more outside the scope of what we're talking about, is to answer back with, with Apple TV, because Google has answered them back with Chromecast. But that's another whole different discussion. Yeah. But uh, again, with the whole Steve Jobs and what Larry Ellison said, it's there's not going to be another guy like that for a long yeah. time. Yeah. So. so, all right. And no, we're not regular people, Sean. No. We're not ordinary people. We don't know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> We're lazy. Sorry. I'm thinking of a John Legend song. Go All for right. it. <laughs> so, other big in interesting news that has come about, and this one here seems to have been uh, released uh, today, actually, is that BlackBerry is going to be for sale, or potentially mm. for sale. Going private, so, right? Well, this is what's been said, officially. Mm -hmm. So... Um, they have announced that they have formed a special committee. Almost like they're the polit they're almost like politicians. It's amazing, huh? Anyway, so they formed a special committee to explore strategic alternatives for itself. The mm -hmm. company is trying to enhance value and increase scale in order to accelerate BlackBerry 10 de de uh, deployment. Excuse me. However, BlackBerry noted in their release that. Uh, Part of their joint ventures could be a sale of its operations to another firm. Hmm. All right. You know what? Do you know what's going on in that boardroom? It's crazy. Well, what's going on there? So, like, uh, they really. I, I got a chance to toy around with Blackberry's uh, phones, and it's actually really nice, in my opinion. So, I mean, interface-wise, it's probably some of the nicest things I've said. That being said, though, uh, this company is at a weird point now where the timing is so bad because. They feel like they have a good product, so they're working so hard to do it, and they don't want the pressure of the public to cave in on their work. So they're trying to take the company private. So that would mean like splitting up its uh, uh, tech stocks to 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 you know bankers and things like that. Now that's that um, the committee is going to probably weigh in on like like how all this joint ventures and other partnerships will will boost interest in in BlackBerry, but it's just kind of hard. Uh, with with BlackBerry and its timing of it all, because I really want them to be successful. Uh, I just don't I don't know how this is all going to fare well because they're, it's a very risky situation now. They're going to a point where they want to take things private so that they don't get the pressure off, but at the same time they're still going to have to perform so that they could uh, pay back their investors, the people who are taking them private. It's kind of like what Dell com uh, Dell Computer is going through right now, but um, yeah, it's 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 risky, but. It, hey, that risk might pay off. You never know. All right. So you're okay. So do you think they're gonna? Do you? This rat. Let's start with you. Do you think this? When? What do you think is the right choice? Should they go for a sellout? Should they go for um, selling maybe part of the company off? Should they? I mean, what direction should they head in? Since they are looking at alternatives to kind of well fix the situation they're in. I mean. What is what do you think is a good choice for them? See, what's really what's tricky about it is that you know you're in a situation where you're you want to sell certain parts of the company so you can stay afloat, but at the same time those parts are so integral to the BlackBerry ecosystem that you can't really live one without the other. So, for instance, BlackBerry without Black, you know, BlackBerry messaging is kind of crazy. Or without BlackBerry Enterprise Server, it's it's like you have to have all of them. So. Uh, it's there's not really that much choice. So what they want to do is they pro they want to. It just seems like to me they're just looking from the outside. 
it seems like to me they want to keep the ecosystem as as much as they want. They want to keep everything inside. They want to. Uh, they don't want to sell off to Google or to Microsoft or or to even Apple and just say, look, let's let's see if we can fight through this and let's not get the bat, you know, the public breathing down us. Let's get some investors who really believe in our product and hopefully we can generate something. Now the only problem is that those investors may not be the best ones, so it just depends on who invests in them. If those people are like diehard BlackBerry fans and they say, you know what, we're going to throw as much money as we can and hopefully you guys come out with a product and the rest of the developers jump in, I think that's going to be the key piece. But I just don't know how it's going to all work out with everything going private and selling almost nothing. I think the only thing they would probably be able to sell uh, is is probably um, probably BlackBerry Enterprise Server, and that's the only thing I could think of. Yeah, I was going to say that. That's the only thing you could think of. That's the only thing that's a really big piece, but then if someone buys it, like, what are they going to do with it? They're just going to end up buying it, they're going to leverage BlackBerry, and they're going to say, well, you know what, we're going to close it now, so all of your BlackBerrys are dead, and uh, that just gives us more leveraging power, we're going to probably make everything Android or Windows Phone or whatever, um, and it's, yeah, it's a very, it's a tough situation. But at the same time, you know, uh, just personally looking at the product, it looks really good. I mean, the interface looks very clean. They, they really went all out in trying to produce something. The problem is just the app. It's just the, the app situation. It's such a big, big deal. One well, other so. thing, if they, if they do go private, they have opportunities to look other ways to divest their income, which mm -hmm. would be uh, licensing BlackBerry. Yes. Yes. You know, they've been good one too. They've been talking. They've been, you know, closely talking with Microsoft for a long time. There's been talks that, you know, well, rumors that HTC or Samsung might not swoop them up, but might buy into the BlackBerry license and put, you know, BB10 on an on an HTC device and or have like an HTC One powered by BlackBerry 10. That actually would be pretty cool. You know, it's a great great hardware. And uh, you know the software, like Rad said, it's actually a very, very cool software. It just it's limited to, to the apps. Yeah. And, you know it, and I think it's also limited to, um, I hate to say it, but public eye. You know, it's it, it's very few and far between that you see a, a new like a, a Z10 or Z10 or or a Q10 or the upcoming A30 uh, tablet or big phone that they're that, that's that's been leaked out. Um, it's, it's uh, you know they, they they have some really good things under their belt, but it's it's just not really catching on. I don't really know what they can do. Maybe a fingerprint scanner, but I really I don't know. What they, yeah. I don't know what they can do. They need to bring the developers. I remember remember Tony when uh, they were uh, well, they trying had so hard. Conference. They had yeah, that they had the conference. conference. They tried to bring the. Android developers on board because they said, oh, you could use these Android wrappers mm -hmm. to work within yeah. the VB environment. Right. And you were commenting about how some of the performance was very, almost minimal and hit, depending on the complexity of those apps. That's true. Now, now the only thing is that my thing is uh, has always been, they've. I felt like they've had everything in place. I just always felt that they've been very um, uh, rookie-ish in terms of communicating with their developers. So, like, if you were trying to look for, like, their documentation for their SDKs, it's very, it's very scarce. It's hard to, there's no starting point. There isn't like an app store to start from or a membership that you could pay for. So it's so, it's kind of hard even for a developer that has the best intentions to develop for the platform. It sucks if you, you know, you're, you're trying to do something but you don't know where to start. I mean, Android now has like a studio where you could just start messing around on the web. Same thing with Windows, same thing with iOS. BlackBerry is one of those that don't have it. So it's really difficult for them unless a, a third party comes in and starts making things easy for them by, you know, like, um, I forgot the name. I think it's called Xamarin. That's like, it's like a third party app that builds all three apps, like, well, iOS, Windows, and, and, and Android. So, but BlackBerry is not on that list. It's the same thing with Unity. I haven't seen Unity support on BlackBerry, so that's kind of a big deal, too. Um, but again, I completely agree with you, Tony. I mean, it's it's one of those things where you're just, you know, do you do spend time more on the feature sets to bring in developers? It's a it's a chicken and egg thing, right? So, what didn't they do like a uh, cash incentive or something to try to get developers? Or was yeah, that that's Microsoft? right. Yeah, no, they both both of them did that. 
both of them did that. So it's like uh, uh, BlackBerry was actually offering free BlackBerry playbooks, you know, for people to uh, to develop on on the system, you know. And but the funny thing is, when developers looked at it, they go, okay, are you developing on VB10 or QNX? So it, it's it's confusing. And that's one thing that BlackBerry has to sort out because you know, like QNX is BlackBerry is part of like, and then you have BB10, which is different. There needs to be like at least with Android, it's Android. You're just changing, you know, screen sizes. But over here, it's like, wait, okay, it's a different language now. <laughs> so on Android, when you buy an app, it works for your t your your tablet and your phone, right? Same thing with iOS, and you know, yeah, like if you buy, yeah, yeah. I mean, not consistently, but, yeah. you know, the same th well, Windows is not even like that, but BlackBerry is, is in that weird situation where everything is different. Mm -hmm. And, and um, it, it's going to be hard. I mean, just imagine trying to make a game, and then someone's like, oh, I downloaded it on my Q10. Why does this not work? <laughs> mm -hmm. So it, it's um, it, it's a tough situation. And those are things, all things considered, you know, the, the app, the app, ecosystem is the place where they should start. That's where they should start thinking of how they should build hardware. Apps, yeah. apps, apps, apps. Yeah, I mean, no, there's nothing else. I mean, seriously. But yeah. I mean, I, I think everybody got got the spec war figured out. You know, everybody's pretty much on the level, on the, on a level playing field. We, we have, like, a minimum uh, requirement that we as public would see as a good device. The minimum requirement says at least a dual-core processor uh, at least a 720p display, front-facing and rear-facing camera, um, one gig of RAM. Those are the things that we would say, okay, this is at least a mid-level to high-end device. But if you don't have the apps, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get that device. So it's and, true. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I talked to Gina, Gina Trapani, and she was telling me, you know what? Uh, developers, I'll be honest with you, developers on Android are kind of lazy. They shouldn't be, but they are. But th what they do is they aim at one device that has it all. So they aim after the Galaxy lines because they know it works there. So they just say, well, let's just do it right here, and we're at least going to get Mac. We're going to hit all those guys, and hopefully if we hit those guys, that's going to hit the HTC ones and everyone else. So they're not fully adequately tested, but at least they're there. Um, well, that also makes sense considering how there's a good market share and amount of people there. Oh, yeah. So why yeah. not test it on a pretty good share? Yeah, share? put it on a huge share that will work consistently across those devices, have a more higher chance of higher ratings with those devices rather than you shooting for a lower end or device that's more scarce and then you have a risk of someone putting a lower end, you know, a low rating from a device that's more widely spread. So... Um, yeah, it's one of those things. It's a gamble, right? You're always playing the strategy game when it comes to like working at on a, on a platform. iOS still the top, like it's still cream de cream, easiest and the best to develop on. So, um, but other than that, BlackBerry, oh, I don't know. Well, it's we'll tough. see what. <laughs> well, we'll see what happens with them. So let's all right. Let's take a break here and let's thank our sponsor, which is Audible.com, and. Um, Let's actually just notice that Audible.com is actually pretty cool because it's actually, when you really think about it, it's like a book club for modern for the modern times. So when you're a member of Audible.com, you actually get uh, you get the option of getting a free book every month. You get discounts on other books, and you actually get one killer return policy. Yes, you actually get to return these digital books if it's not the right one for you. They have over a hundred thousand. No, oh, excuse me, let me get this right. Over a hundred and fifty thousand titles on there now. So the titles are just adding up. They are stacking up, and the titles are still are new releases like um, what we have here: Inside Baseball, the best of Tom Verducci, as well as bestsellers like uh, The Inferno, a novel by Dan Brown. So it is a great a great service that you definitely should check out. Now we're gonna give you a little uh, URL here, which is gonna give you 30 days to be part of be, get a, be a member, so you can check out these features. And that URL, just so I give it to you now, is audibletrial.com forward slash lazy. Use that URL and you'll get all these benefits. So you'll get discounts on other books, free monthly books. You'll also get a part of a great return policy. You get the bestsellers, new releases, and more. So audibletrial.com forward slash lazy is what you want to use to check out uh, quite a modern book club and, well, kind of, well, remember the great literary arts and books out there. So, All right. Now, Wi-Fi. We like Wi-Fi, right? 
Yeah, anyway. So, wi is good. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Tony, you mentioned a while back, um, well, we talked a little while back about Google using these balloons in Africa to try to get Internet to other places. And, of course, Bill Gates started saying how it's not going to cure malaria. But it looks like Google, regardless of knowing they're not curing malaria with this uh, project, is moving forward with the project and they're doing some testing, right? Yeah, I don't think malaria was on the project build list of things to, <laughs> things to accomplish. Uh, while we're up there, let's sell some ads and destroy malaria. Like, yeah, that sounds good. Makes sense. <laughs> well, well, let's take malaria off the list. But let's definitely do some ads while we're at it, right? Well, the idea, if people don't know, uh, out of Google Lab X or Google X Labs or whatever, they have this Project Loon, which is essentially these weather balloons that float up in the ether above the atmosphere, um, above where planes fly, so they're not going to be... They're not going to be in the way of planes or anything like that. They basically give Wi-Fi signal um, to in uh, to areas where you where where you can't normally get internet service. So they tested this out in uh, New Zealand, and it actually is a success. They only had like 50 people on it at the same time. So at the moment in testing, it's not it's not good for like a whole town. It may be good for a village, <laughs> whatever the population of that is. Um, but they're bringing this technology to California's Central Valley to, quote, to research various approaches for improving the technology, like power systems, like solar panel and batteries, envelope design, and radio configuration. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the fact is that it, it is coming here to the states, but it's not really for commercial use. It's really just for a test, another test bed, if you will. But that's really it. How do you link onto the Wi-Fi channel? I don't know. I, like, I, I think the Wi-Fi network is like I don't know. Google Google Loon. You log in and you type in your password. Google Loon. All right. So this is exciting, dude. I'm actually pretty pumped. I'm actually happy to see they're moving forward with another project. Like they did the Google Fiber, and there's a lot of people who are very excited about that. Looks like they got something going on over here. Yeah. Yep. But uh, then Africa isn't that big of a place, so I'm sure they'll need a. Uh, though they won't need that many balloons to cover that area, right? No, just like three. <laughs> three balloons is fine. Cover the... <laughs> All right, now... 99 okay. red balloons. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, another, a much cooler, much more interesting thing that almost brings the future to the... Well, to now, or hopefully to the near future, is something that... Um, mm. Well, I, I, I forget his name. I'm looking at it now, and I'm uh, not... Elon, Elon Musk. Uh, Elon Thank Musk. You. Yeah. Thank you. Elon Musk has here. So, uh, Tony, what is this new high-speed transportation system that he's proposing? Well, first of all, the future is now, but it's like 10 years from now. And the idea is that he is going to possibly invest in what is coined as Hyperloop. It will be a, I guess, like a little pod, if you will, that is in a tube, very similar to the, the basic principle is the same kind of air cushion um, tube that that you have uh, with like at banks and like at Costco that they send the the money from the teller to you know to the back end and it's just this air driven kind of pneumatic tube and he's gonna he wants to build something similar to that but to hold people and traveling at over 700 miles per hour uh, you could actually get from here San Francisco all the way to LA in under 30 minutes and you know for businesses that'd be great. And that'd be amazing. You could, you know, really close a lot of those business deals that would really only close in person versus doing it over Skype or Hangout or something like that. Um, but the reality of it is that it's going to take 10 years for, with investment and everything, and obviously all through uh, with R and D and everything. But you know, Musk isn't, you know, he's not one to be um, to 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 think inside the box. He 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 was a co-founder of, of PayPal before online payment was a thing. Uh, co-founder of um, of the Tesla um, Motors, which is you know the elect electric cars, high-end electric cars over here in Silicon Valley, and um, and SpaceX, the commercial, uh, the commu, commu uh, the uh, the you know privately funded space exploration thing that he wants to be able to give to just everyday people who have a couple of million dollars to get up into space. So this this is something he's doing that he wants to do too. So it's it's pretty amazing uh, if this ever does go into um, you know in, into actual production. Now, Sean, you had mentioned if it goes from here to Florida, 
how much better that's going to be for you know, families and this and that. He said that this kind of technology would really only work for cities that are 900 miles or less apart. So well, unless that, Florida moved, uh, the, the technology that he's talking about is really only good for 900 miles or closer. So, well, um, yeah. That doesn't mean they can't just have multiple things, like the way airports work right now. Like Oh, like terminals? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, yeah. okay. They're going okay. to they're gonna have to have a terminal anyway. They just can't randomly just – they're going to have terminals anyway. So if you keep the terminals from distances between like San Francisco and L.A., maybe the next one from L.A. to Arizona, next one from Arizona to Texas, and you can pretty much hop skip over. It might take a half an hour, half an hour, half an hour, half an hour. But depending on how fast you can get the people on or off and how fast the things can transport, you could possibly get someone halfway across the nation in about half the time versus flying them. If the proposed ideas of how fast, if this thing works as advertised, or the, now, what saying. We're looking at speeds around Mach 1.1. Actually, and it's about the same, maybe a little less, though. Yeah. It's about the same. What? The plane. It's nuts. So, like the everyday person, I don't know if they would be able to withstand that kind of uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? G's. Well, not just G's, but pressure. Yeah, on their body. <laughs> See, like, that's, oh, I'm yeah, going to work now, which happens to be in Hollywood. <laughs> you well, know, that's you the get there. That's the one thing that got me about this. Like, the one question that we don't know is how will the human body take to that? Now, we do know how the human body takes when we go to space. And I forget how fast we travel to get to space. And I'm sure that whatever it is they're doing to the body to try to protect us in that situation without having to go up against gravity, mm -hmm. they're probably going to have to do something similar to the tube, because that's essentially what you'll be in, <laughs> to mm -hmm. protect us so that we don't feel it. Maybe just pressurize it the way they see it, same way they do airplanes, and then after you're pressurized, whoo, shoot them along the tube, done. Yeah, but that, that, I don't, I don't think the pressure, like pressurizing a cabin, like they do, they're they're not reducing the amount of G's. You still feel it when you're when the plane does this. Yeah, but this time you're, I don't know, I'm, there has to be some, they have to think of a way, because that is my one concern, is what happens when we do travel 900, do we get squished on the inside, and do we, <laughs> I got yeah. an answer for you. What do you got? Space shuttle, maximum G's, G forces during launch and re-entry, three G's. Three G's. There you go. So how, now, what is the effect that it has on the pe the astronauts? Like these, those, they go through major training to get prepared for that. We're talking about a transportation that's going to be a third of that speed that mom and pop can just hop on and go down to LA. And visit. Yeah, I mean that that definitely you have to really wonder that. I'm pretty sure they're going to uh, include those kinds of things, and they're probably going to have to think about like at what speed is going to be acceptable for that kind of transportation. Um, there's probably also going to be, um, my thought is that it's probably going to be, uh, if they accelerate in such a way where they're going fast and not so fast where you're not feeling all those G-forces, or at least the one that's acceptable, then, I don't know, it somewhat feels doable. I'm totally out of my element in this because I know nothing about physics. I know nothing about, like... Well, I know <laughs> when you fly a plane, they pressurize the cabin, so yeah. Yeah. that might so have an gonna... effect. Mm. They're definitely going to pressurize the tube. That has to happen. Mm -hmm. And, it's, and it, they just have to that do That doesn't it. affect your Gs, though. Wow. When, right. case, okay, so, case in point, <laughs> when, you, when, when it goes turbulent, mm -hmm. when there's turbulence, you right. feel right. The, you the pressurizing of, cab, of the cabin is, is only because when you go that high up in the air, we can't right. breathe. That's yeah, all it is. Point. It's not. It has nothing to do but, but with counteracting the amount of G's. Mm -hmm. You there's still no feel way. it when they when they go into the dive and everything. But there's mm -hmm. no way we'd breathe at 900 miles per hour in a tube. <laughs> okay, so that's a different situation though. That that's something different. That's that would be maybe like an oxygen mask. <laughs> that everybody I'm, put on your oxygen masks. <laughs> That'd be great. What they do that for astronauts. Well, yeah, but if you're going that fast, that's what you're gonna have. They do that for fighter pilots. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's right. That's an oxygen mask. Yeah, but so you, you can't you can't assume that they're not gonna have oxygen masks for for co the commuters if they ha if they have it for like fighter pilots and they're going about the same speed. Like, oh, well, you're just a businessman. You can breathe oxygen. We'll we'll, we'll figure it out for you. No, they're they're gonna have some sort of oxygen mask. 
Well, then this then this plan is not going to work if they're going to require people to wear oxygen masks. I'm Why? Sorry. It's just hell. Why? Hey, we got a brand new. You think it's just a, we're over? You think Elon Musk is just shooting a little bit too high? Well, or are you just shooting high to aim a little lower? You know, it all comes down to this one el this one question that we are arguing about, which is something that we need a physics major or a physics person to kind of answer. Matter of fact, if you are a physics major and you know the answer to how the body affects. <laughs> Why don't you email us? Because this will be a really good answer. I actually do want to know the answer to this question. This is because honestly, if the human body has problems ex doing this, then I can't see this working because we just can't do it. It's like you can't have make this big, expensive, crazy project and only have two percent of the population take advantage of it. It's a waste of time. You have to have a good portion of the people be able to take advantage of it, which means they have to figure out a way of getting us from point A to point B without us feeling those. That pressure, that th whatever the G's or whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, I think I, I'm a, I somewhat in agreement with both of you guys because number one, I think one we probably don't need a mask because we don't know. I mean, it's just another obstacle to deal with, right? But the other thing too is the pressure is going to be such a big deal because it becomes a health risk, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And if you're going to be going at that speed, I mean, the only thing I can think of, even when you go on BART, people are not using belts. You know what I mean, it's like <laughs> you kind of you want to have something where you go in and it just it just runs. You just sit in, and my my thoughts are you're just going. It's probably going to be a specialized seat that you're going to be sitting in. I don't know if it's going to be really going this fast, but it's probably going. It's his thought of what he thinks it should be. So again, this is this is still all conceptual, right? It's not really like um, something that they've proven, you know, that oh, we're actually we actually tried doing some, you know, proof of concepts with this. They haven't, right? From my understanding of it, not yet. But it's the talk, and I don't know. It's just an interesting theory how you know we're gonna become the the, the tubes that we used to see at the banks when we travel around. Or like Futurama, really. It almost seems kind of backwards because it's like this is technology we used to use back in the days where we're like sending messages up and down buildings, right, through a tube. It so, works. Except it's going right. horizontal versus vertical, right? And right. And it works for if it works for paper, it's got to work for humans. Well, <laughs> maybe. It's just simple, dude. It just works. Maybe. <laughs> All I right. still like the fact that do you remember that article that we wrote back in the days where they were using superconducting? Where uh, it was something that was uh, they were using some sort of uh, I guess material that was frozen at a very very low levels that it was floating off of a rail, um, and you could even position it. I can't remember what it was, but it was called superconducting superconducting ice, and um, yeah, if you I it, vaguely so. remember that. Yeah, but um, it's actually pretty awesome. I hope they make something use of that. It, it's like a prequel to. Like um like you know the hoverboard or whatever, they did a vehicle version of it. Who knows? You know, if you like a minority report or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, I'm actually gonna look for it right now. Hmm. All right. Actually, well, that does bring up a good question. How like how does how does the I know it's science fiction, but like, yeah, what yeah. technology did they use in like Star Trek and Star Wars when they went to warp drive or hyperspace? To counteract the G's, and they're just sitting there in the cockpit, like, "All right, hyperspace." You saw the stars, <laughs> and they're just like, "Yay, hyperspace!" <laughs> in real life, it's like, "Ah!" I know, but maybe is this warp really work? That did he use rocket thrust, or did he just use something where they're bending light? Yeah. So it's interesting. I mean, it's a whole physics thing. It's actually, I was thinking, I was thinking the same thing. Only I was thinking ancient aliens. <laughs> you know, no. too much history channel, man. <laughs> no, no, actually, no. I was, uh, it's, I just love how the ancient aliens guys is memes ends up all over the internet, and every time I think of uh -huh. something. No, actually, when I was thinking about this, I was, I was, I was imagining the human tube, the tube of humans going along the way, and I'm thinking, well, the way they would have it, it technically would just be floating and going along. I was like, well, would they have? I say, like, what if they found some way of magnetizing the rocks and got? Nah, I can't do that. Anyway, and that's how they get those big ass boulders and move them. Anyway, all right, so, because technically, take two magnets, flip them upside down, they might float. All right, so, Legos, dude, Legos, this is something cool, I guess, for kid, people who like kids. Tony, I think you got excited for this. You can rent Legos Something cool now. for people who like kids? No. <laughs> I get something what you're saying, cool though. for people who have kids. Oh, those things. There you go, those things. Kids. Those little things. <laughs> so, what do we got here, man? What is Legos, man? 
The Legos, not no, not the kids. Um, yeah, Plegos is actually a Netflix-like rental service for Lego sets, and I'm reading it verbatim, but it pretty, that's pretty much what it is. Um, a lot of the expensive Lego sets that I personally want are in the hundreds of dollars. I, I know the Super Star Destroyer that uh, was built on Twit was like over $300, $400, and I personally just cannot afford that at this moment. But with Plego you can rent them for as low as $15 a month. So your options are uh, for a small kind of small to medium set that's only $15 a month. Um, Superfan is uh, medium to large sets for $25 a month. And then Megafan is like small to huge sets for 40 bucks a month. Now you might say, oh, $40, that's a lot. But depending on what you're doing, if you're just building the Lego and if you're really dedicated to building the Lego set, it might only... Um, you know, it might only take you a couple of days to build, and that only costs you 40 bucks to build the mega, you know, Millennium Falcon. And you have that under your belt. You can take pictures, you can take video, you can really pretend that it was yours for that month, and then you <laughs> you send it back, and then you're good to go. Uh, the other thing too about it is that according to the company, uh, there's no charge for lost pieces, and they are all clean and sanitized. So I don't know how you would verify that. I guess when you get it. You know, put a black light over it or something. Wait, wait, wait. No charge for lost pieces. Yeah, so that's what the front page states. I don't know if there's a, I don't know if there's a, um, if there's like a minimum, because I joked, so I, I put a comment and I joked, so if I lose 95% of the pieces, I'm, you know, quote, unquote, I lose them all, except for like five pieces, it's okay. All right, all right, and I'll, I'll, I'll do that, and I get, get to keep it all for myself. Everyone seems to be into that rental game now, huh? Legos, arcade Legos, games, yeah. Subscription and rentals are the thing to be. It's like mm -hmm. you can't get money for, you can't get a lump sum. Just pay us slowly, later and over time. <laughs> that seems to be a big thing. Really, you can. I'm just actually trying to look to see. Can you really like lose almost all the pieces? No charges for lost pieces. Free shipping. Huh. That's so funny. Well, here's your uh, one of the X wings back. <laughs> here's R2. This is all I had left. Oh, I got you. Can do with that. Here's the window for the Falcon. Have fun. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have Han's head here. <laughs> the rest of it, you said it's all right, right? As long as one of the pieces come back. Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm yeah, i going to cancel my membership, too. Have a great day. See you guys later. <laughs> I don't know, dude. This is just... I, I like... I, I don't know. I guess... Maybe I just feel some things should be rentable and some things probably shouldn't be. And uh, for some reason, I'm part and chalking this up to really this. Really, yeah, I, think, I think there's a fine print missing. It's sort of like you know, Seven Flags. You know, wash all you want for 15 minutes. <laughs> so it's really like that. I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't see how anyone can actually rent something where there's missing pieces. That's like a, almost weird. Well, but. they would have to keep filling in all the pieces. So they must be make they must be buying these pieces for like a dollar each, renting them for fifteen bucks. So as long as every as long as they can rent it out, 50, I mean, as long as they rent it out once, they've already made fifteen times the money. It's got to be something crazy like that. Otherwise, I mean, losing the pieces would cost them too much money. But eh, well, that, they got this figured out. So I got an answer. Um, on under their FAQs, what happens if the set is missing a piece? Do I get charged? You will not get charged for any piece that might be missing from your set. Uh, we will make sure our sets leave our processing center with other pieces. If you can't find the piece, please check the sp uh, spare bags. Um, and they will actually email you. Uh, they'll actually send you replacement parts if, if you... Uh, if you're that's actually missing pieces. That's got to be a pain in the ass if you're the guy that's in the procurement department. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're coming in there, you're looking at there and go, something's got to be missing. <laughs> we need a 4x4 squared yeah. in yellow. We need you know, a 4x4. torpedo was gone. You know? We need a 4x4 yeah. squared in yellow. I need a 7x2 <laughs> yeah. square in purple. I need a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you imagine it's just like people in support. They're just like, I'm missing these pieces, and they're just clicking them on the diagram. Like someone has to come up with a 3D model for that one. This, like, can you crap. imagine their model numbers? They probably have model numbers that make. <laughs> yeah, for every part. <laughs> oh, you need the. Uh, I need a four by four red square piece. Oh, you mean a I seven know, two eight? Okay, got it. What sixty five? Oh yeah, with that one. Oh man. Uh, so I don't know. I applaud them for doing it. I don't. Yeah. I don't think I don't see why toys should be rentable. But hey, you know what? If it's a good model and it helps fill out in some way, I guess it's and great. It's nothing new. Tony, yeah. you, you guys watch um, uh, what's it called? Um, 
what's that? The sharks, shark, shark Tank. Shark Tank. Shark. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they had something like that where these people oh, yeah? were renting out toys. But yeah, it was trippy. I was like, yeah, that could work depending what kind of toys they are. <laughs> Legos is more something that definitely people uh, is more popular than what I would say what they have or had they had at Shark Tank. But even that though, I'm like, I'm on the fence with Legos because I love to build them and I love to be able to look on my mantelpiece and say, I built that. Yeah, exactly. That's what I built. But then there are some things like, like I said, the 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 mega super uber awesome super star destroyer. Yeah. I want that, but I have yes. no place to put it. So yeah. I'll build it, and then I'll send it back. It'll only cost me forty bucks and a lifetime of awesome memories and yeah. a cool GoPro, Mm-mm. really quick video camera of me building it. Yeah, and that's a tenth and of the actual dude, price. It's a four hundred dollar uh, <laughs> uh, set on Amazon right now. And it's like though those are those are my two options because like after I build it I'm not gonna do anything else with it and I'm gonna f- unless I plan on you know unless I plan on doing like a live action or stop motion video with it or something like that I I'm gonna dismantle it because there's no place for me to put it so I I think you know Plego at least for the larger pieces Plego is kind of bank- banking on that. For the fifteen dollar plan, for like the small sets and stuff, just go to Toys R Us or go to TJ Maxx and get a clearance Lego set for your kid. You know, for eight yeah. bucks. You know, you don't need Target. to do a, or yeah. Yeah, even Target. You don't need to do a fifteen dollar plan. But the the, the forty dollar plan. Get a one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But the forty the forty dollar dollar plan for some of the larger sets that makes sense to me. But I don't know if there's going to be enough people who are under that same mind frame. Obviously, Sean is not. You know, but you know, of, of, of the of the four of us, I don't know. We might we might be fifty fifty on that. So, Andrew, so, what what do you think about that? I think it's ridiculous. Great. Okay, so me and Andrew. Are- <laughs> right, so check this out, Rhett, Tony. See, I just want to right, Tony. I just want to throw this out there. If you cannot find a place to put that huge Millennium Falcon, you need to go talk to Victor. Yeah, you go to either or that or talk to his dad. They hey. will tell you where to put a very large sculpture in the house. It's not. Uh, a problem I was gonna say we should be glad that Lego does bed. not make a it's have its own pillow. <laughs> Shoot, they, if Lego make a Batman thing, that'd be great. Like a big, huge, standing Batman pose, doing this like this. Yeah, Victor will be there. inside it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so. So our last topic that we have for today is another very interesting one. This one here kind of came out of left field also. So Amazon CEO, the Jeff Bezos, he has actually, well, it is being reported that uh, Amazon is making a games console, Android-based games console, very similar to, I I would say, the Ooh Yeah. But um, you know what? Android. I mean, sorry. Amazon has a, already a very well established marketplace already, and a very lot of good stuff. So, well, guys, what do you think of this? Amazon joining the console market game. <laughs> All right. Andrew has put his hands up in his face. All right. Explain. Face palm. Explain. Explain, explain your face palm, dude. I don't know. I mean, like we technically already have what. Project Shield as an example that's already running Android as an example already. So, I mean, it, I guess it kind of diversifies stuff, but it's just, I don't know. The concept seems kind of silly. To, at least DOA? to me. Huh? You think it's DOA? Dead on arrival? Not necessarily, but it, it just it's kind of silly because it's like, okay, but I guess that sounds kind of cool, but how are you going to implement it? Is it going to still be like a, uh, you know, this type of format with a little controller attached to it, or how, how is it going to be executed? Hmm. Yeah. That, that's that. So, but like I said, it's it's just it's like okay, go on. <laughs> that that's just. Maybe it's just so, a cable for their like their mm-hmm. Kindle Fire. <laughs> we I have a game console. Thinking, Here's the cable that touches to your TV. Yeah, I mean, I'm I was not thinking totally maybe bad. it was maybe it's not a game console per se, but maybe mm-hmm. it's a like a like a competitor to Steam or Gaikai. Like maybe yeah. maybe that they no, would do the that's more viable. Yeah. No, I say it's a Ouya competitor. I think Amazon I think, saw what I think what Amazon saw with the Ouya is trying to do. They saw the interest in that and they were like, we can do that and it won't even cost us that much money. Let's just go ahead and build one of those. So let's outdo these guys because we're a bigger, better company with more money. And an established ecosystem. There are so many backers on Ouya, what the hell happened? Well, I mean, yeah, a lot of them well, got disappointed. Yeah, I mean, it was I got disappointed. I have the Ouya. I haven't touched it. 
And it's How like... would you? No. Yeah, I just like... What is here that is like any cool? And um, all the stuff I'm playing are on iOS. So I, I was just kind of like disappointed. I was disappointed in the construction of it. But mainly it was mostly the games because I'm just going to be out outright out about it. There's not really any kind of games that are really hardcore in the Android marketplace that really warrants you know, something that's like, oh, I have to get this. There's not a Resident Evil on there or like, you know, a God of War or Gears of War or a and, Mass Effect. Well, Mass that's... Effect, yes. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's still um, like, it's a different market. It's a totally different market. I think it, to it as like, to me, it's more synonymous with Amazon going their cheapy route, right? They're, they've always known to be the company that's economical, they're trying to go after that market. So I feel like, you know, Ouya will be 99 bucks, Amazon's will be 50 bucks. That's kind of how I would see it. Like, it's probably going to be a dongle similar to, like, uh, you know, Chromecast. Like, just plug it in, and then here's your games. You put your Wi-Fi and connect it on, and then, I mean, that's something I see Amazon doing. It seems like it's part of their, you know, their company culture to do that. I don't see them coming out with something that's going to be going head to head with something like the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One, but something cheap. So, well, um, it definitely when I point, I mean, they would have to they would have to have a good successful basic one, show have a good support, and then they could probably go after the big boys after that. But you don't just jump immediately and go after them. Especially yeah, with, I don't, they don't. Especially with Android, they shouldn't being go. The basis, they should with not. Android being the basis of it all, they should not. They should just go after. They should stick with the market they're best known to do. Because Amazon is not known to be like a a power hitter against like. To try to, I mean, you're trying to convince big guys like Konami, Capcom, and Square Enix to say, hey, build your, all your crap on here. Bring Final Fantasy over. They're not going to risk their franchise on that. They're going to be like, well, we're probably going to put, I don't know, uh, Chaos Rings or something, but we're not going to put all of our stuff there. So it's it's one of those things where, you know, it's a mobile market, right? You're trying to get that the, the Angry Birds crowd to buy into it. You're not trying to get like me or Andrew to jump into it. It's going to be Angry Birds and all the Rovio stuff and all the similar stuff to it. You know, Simpsons like tapped out, whatever. Gamers. Yeah, the casual gamers, you know, that are just going to be like, hey, this is 50 bucks. Yeah, let me try it. My hand you know, on it. They're also going after the malls. They're going after all the individual booths in the malls that sell those yeah. gaming systems that have all. That makes the, sense. They're going, they're going after them. They're going after yeah. all the. They're pretty much. They're going all the basic. Hey, you know what? Little game console, thirty dollars, hundred dollars, fifty dollars, whatever. Dude, it's a value them. thing. Just yeah. people that buy, you know, Atari flashbacks, and they know nothing about games. They just go, they go to like a Fry store, and they'll say, "Ooh, Atari flashback for thirty bucks." It has like the you know fifty games I used to play back in the days I never played before. I have one just, of those. and that would be it. I'm serious. <laughs> I have There's one people of those. that do that, and they they make large margins doing that way. So and and Amazon's always you know they're all about making large margin uh, large margins on on you know low cost hardware. So you know just it's smart. It's a smart thing to do. And then they'll have their books on there. They'll have all the other stuff on there. They're trying to take over the living room too. So everyone wants the living room. <laughs> But. So, Tiger Electronics better beware, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why Link's making a comeback. Yeah. So, it's so, yeah, so this is going to be an interesting thing. I think this is true. I think they're going to do it. I think this yeah. is Ouya Inspire, and I have, and I'm, yeah. the percentage, the chance of this help are hurting um, Sony or Microsoft is, <laughs> yeah, right. The, um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, like I said, the hardcore games are there. I've been hearing rumors, though rumblings on the NeoGAF forums that um, Amazon has been working to try to get bigger name developers over on their camp to get some nice profile games for it. But at the same time, those are all rumors, rumblings, and all the high profile developers in the world still won't give you a hit game. Games are kind of luck of the draw and a lot of work, so it's hard to say if it'll be enough to make it sell. Needs better hardware. Well, we don't know That's what hardware they're going to use. Exactly. Well, you know what? well, one thing we do have, to, one thing that they do have an advantage of, and this is something that the OEA has an advantage of, is it's always plugged in, which means the processor doesn't have to worry about battery life. It can just worry about the game. So hopefully. Mm -hmm. You can utilize that and hopefully develop a better game, but you know that's who knows if that's going to happen. All right, so we'll see what happens about Amazon and all that. And with that, we have now come to the end of the show. Everybody, I would like to thank you guys all for hanging out with me, Andrew, Tony, and Rad. You guys are all awesome as always. 
I would also like to thank you all, you guys out there, for hanging out with all of us, listening to us, and checking out our entire show. Yes, it's okay. Shed it to you, Tony. It's okay. I don't, it's touching. It's touching. <laughs> so, as the uh, so as we end the show, let's go ahead and give you some contact information. So you can give us a call at area code 707-722-5299. You can email us at comments at lazytechguys.com. We are found on all the social networks, which is Google Plus. Um, Twitter and uh, excuse me and Facebook. If you look up Lazy Tech Guys, you'll find us on all of those. And our YouTube channel is Lazy Tech TV. Go ahead and follow it, subscribe to our channel there, and keep updated on the different things that we have going on. All right, this, we'll be back next. We'll be back tomorrow with a show called The Wireless Weekly, where we talk weekly. And then we have later on this week the Lords of Gaming, which we're going to talk about many different things, including probably the new latest Microsoft 180. If you haven't heard about yeah. that, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> very interesting. I'm just gonna wait till it all 180s out, and then we'll talk about it at the end. There we go. Yeah, pretty right. much. <laughs> Guys, we'll be back next week with another absolutely fun-filled episode. And guess what? Hey, we are out. See you later. Mm-hmm.